All right, so good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, for today's uh, talk on uh, fiscal policy responses to COVID-19. Um, welcome to this uh, Geneva Microlabs online talk. Um, I think it's, uh, I believe it's the 15th or 16th talk now that we have done since the start of the uh, webinar series. My name is Eckhard Ernster and uh, I'm pleased to be the president of Geneva Microlabs. Uh, I will be moderating today's uh, webinar together with uh, Daniel Saman, who will uh, hand over the, uh, the Q&A session after the introductory talks. Um, so given that we have a couple of people who are new to our talk series uh, um, and to Geneva Microlabs, let me just give some quick uh, intro to what Geneva Microlabs is. We are basically a do tank that uh, combines research to a, a multi-stakeholder platform uh, to leverage what we believe is a unique uh, institutional financial and human capital uh, in and around Lake Geneva. Um, we, we want to bring together basically the leading minds uh, from public and private, from finance, from academia, from international organizations uh, and from civil society and help uh, uh, through this webinar series basically to achieve uh, or to get us all closer to the global challenges identified by the Sustainable Development Goals. So together with our community and together with you basically, what we want to achieve is we want to develop new insights and uh, co-create opportunities for action, for actionable uh, uh, solutions that uh, uh, address the complexity of the tasks ahead, um, like the current pandemic, like the responses to the current pandemic, and, uh, and see what we can identify as solutions to a situation where there's no quick fix uh, to, to solve the situation. Uh, so before we look at today's agenda, I have one question to all of you and, uh, and I would like you to use the chat box for this, which is in which country are you currently located? We are very keen on uh, expanding um, our international community and uh, like to uh, add to uh, our comment box, uh, basically your, the country uh, for where you're currently uh, dialing in from. So thank you very much for this in advance. Um, so let's have a look at the agenda for today. We basically have two uh, presentations uh, followed by our Q&A. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the first one is uh, the price to pay for softening the COVID-19 blow, uh, which will be delivered by Dr. Murray Owens Thompson from Indosuez Wealth Management. Uh, the second presentation will be on fiscal policy responses to the pandemic, challenges in bringing the state back in by Professor Ringa Raudler from the Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. And uh, as usual, this will be followed then by our Q&A and open discussion. And we already invite you now to start uh, um, during the presentation to start posting your questions in the, in the chat box. Huh? Uh, some housekeeping rules, uh, as I said, please feel free to comment and post your questions while, we'll, while you're listening to the uh, presentation. Uh, use the Zoom, Zoom chat box uh, for that and, uh, and raise your hand if you want. You can find the chat box, at the chat tool on the bottom uh, of the screen. I think in my case it's actually on the top of the screen, but you will, if you click on the screen or if you uh, click on the, uh, the, your application, you will see the, uh, the chat tool popping up. Uh, also, please do mute, your, mute yourself why, uh, when you're not presenting or when you're not asked to uh, ask your question so that we avoid any background noise and have a, a good experience for all of us. Uh, one more information, this webinar will be recorded, uh, mostly because we want to make sure that all of you have the possibility uh, to review it in after the talk and, and maybe also share the link with your network and, and obviously also to engage, continuously engage with our speakers and with our community uh, uh, on, on the YouTube link. Uh, the webinar, or uh, the link to the video will be available later this uh, week. So first of all, uh, I would like to invite Mary Owens to, uh, uh, to the stage uh, and it's my pleasure for, to, before she does that, to, to introduce her and to give a bit of background on her. Uh, Dr. Mary Owens Thompson is uh, currently the Global Chief Economist at Indosuez and that already since 2011. Mary is a veteran economist and strategist for major international banking groups such as HSBC and Merrill Lynch for over 20 years. She also has a broad experience in the outside the financial uh, sector, notable with IKEA, the uh, home equipment company, and she also founded her own company specialized in equipment for horses and riders, and we 
had the pleasure uh, earlier this week to talk to chat with her and could see how excited she is still is about horse riding uh, in general. So um, that might be not the topic for tonight, but if you want to reach out to her on that, I mean, I guess she would be happy to answer your questions. Mary holds an MBA from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, as well as a PhD in international economics from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva here in Switzerland. Mary, may I ask you to unmute yourself and to and share the presentation and give you control to click the slides forward. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I assume I am uh, now unmuted. Yeah. You guys can hear me, yeah? Nobody's answering. Yes, yes, yes. Very well. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So, uh, so obviously there's, uh, there's always a price to pay. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, let me see if I can now. Yes, there we go. And, uh, and, and we shouldn't worry so much about the, ah, my computer is very sensitive. There we go. I think, uh, you know, the immediate uh, objective is, of course, to try to replace uh, all these lost incomes and try to any, every extent possible to prevent bankruptcies. And this is not necessarily right now the moment to fret too much about um, you know, how we are going to uh, deal with the mounting debt burden that will be a consequence of all of this. And um, just reading the FT today, for instance, I think uh, that we've seen uh, that uh, bankruptcies are indeed increasing, certainly in the US. And, uh, and, and I feel personally very concerned that many of these supports for various groups of people will expire during the month of July. So, uh, so I think uh, we might not, uh, I hope actually, we have not seen the end of these support packages. I think we will need more of those to come. But uh, already at this junction, the response has been clearly unprecedented. And uh, in terms of uh, how much it represents in percent of the GDP of various countries, uh, Japan holds the current world record with uh, some 40% of GDP. Uh, on average, I think we can say that it's around 10% uh, or so of GDP in mature economies and perhaps uh, something more around 4% uh, or so in the, uh, in the emerging markets. So, uh, you know, once we, uh, of course, hope and look forward to the day when uh, we will not be in the midst of the pandemic, uh, then we will start worrying about what to do with all of this mounting debt. And, uh, and I just wanted to say a few things uh, about, um, about this because it was already a huge issue going into this crisis. So uh, uh, sometimes, you know, we compare this crisis with previous crises and obviously uh, including uh, the Second World War, for instance. And a big difference with the Second World War was that then countries went into that war not uh, unreasonably indebted already, whereas we entered this crisis with already record uh, high debt levels, and that's obviously, uh, you know, perturbing now that we're adding so much to this. So it's important that we understand uh, really uh, the, uh, the magnitude of all of this, and the magnitude is actually poorly represented by the preferred indicator. Certainly in financial markets, most people look at uh, debt to GDP. So, of course, whenever we're doing a ratio, we have two things that are evolving. So if you have a very large debt, but, uh, but perhaps an even larger GDP, then your ratio is going to mask, to a certain extent, your problems. And that's indeed what's happening uh, regarding the US, because if you look at this chart, you see that when we just look at the amount of sovereign uh, debt outstanding, debt issued by governments, we see that very clearly in this picture that the US on its own represents a third of all the outstanding debt and that the US debt is larger than Japan's. Whereas, of course, if I just ask uh, most of the audience I speak to uh, which country they think is the most indebted, they will uh, usually answer Japan. So how we look at these things affects our perception of, uh, of the problem and, uh, and we have to sort of do the whole tour of the issue before we can have a full appreciation of how big the problem is. So, uh, of course, we have to mention Italy in this case. It tends to, uh, you know, make hearts flutter, certainly in, in uh, again, financial markets when we talk about Italy's debt. And I think that it's, uh, you know, necessary to realize that the size of Italy's debt is the same as that of France. 
And then of course we have these outlying countries such as Switzerland and, and, and Switzerland is actually beaten by Estonia. <laughs> but uh, these are countries with very low debt ratios that should borrow more, but there's not so many of those. So, um, so that was just a, an introduction to the debt issue, so to speak. Now, how do countries accumulate all this debt? Well, they do that by running budget deficits. And usually budget deficits should be, so to speak, cyclical. They should be in deficit in the budget when uh, the business cycle is, is poor and, uh, and, and run surpluses uh, at the top of the business cycle. But what's happened actually over a, a large number of years is that these deficits have basically become structural and all, you know, large amount of countries are running deficits perpetually every year, another deficit. And, and when this fiscal uh, evolution uh, becomes structural in this way, it can uh, dominate uh, the monetary policy situation. So in economics, we call this fiscal dominance. And, um, and when we are in a situation of fiscal dominance, monetary policy might not be able to be uh, set completely on its own terms, but it might have to take the fiscal side into account. Now, this is, of course, an issue of uh, lots of debate about, amongst economists. I don't know if I necessarily represent the consensus, but it's certainly my assessment that we're currently in a state of fiscal dominance and that this uh, exerts a certain constraint on monetary policy because if we had, uh, luckily this is not the case, but if we had a large increase in inflation <laughs> currently, for instance, it would be uh, problematic for the central banks to raise interest rates because they could provoke a domestic uh, crisis if they were to do such a thing. So indeed, uh, very luckily, uh, inflation is low. And of course, we can discuss uh, the various forces that uh, influence uh, inflation, but I think the dominant forces in this case are also structural. Inflation in recent years has not really responded much to, to cyclical measures. And, um, and, and, uh, and therefore, the central banks, we can argue, um, you know, might for this reason not have been very successful in getting inflation up to their target of uh, mostly two uh, percent and uh, the little chart here uh, that I'm showing is that um, uh, you, you can see the light blue line is uh, service price inflation and the dark blue line is goods price inflation so the technological revolution has definitely dampened goods price inflation for a large number of years but we see no impact as of yet really on service prices and this I think will be the next leg of disinflation going forward so I would certainly expect uh, many years, if not decades, uh, of, of low, you know, historically low inflation going forward. Might rise from where we are now, but still uh, not be a, a problem in the foreseeable future. Okay, let's see if I can manage to, there we go. Yeah, so uh, then there's a, a lot of interesting things, that, at least if you're an economist, <laughs> to discuss about fiscal bomb dominance. And uh, one of the, issues is what kind of policy tools are the most effective when you're in a situation of fiscal dominance and also just the fact that interest rates are already so low uh, is a, a further reason to question you know how do we actually articulate monetary policy uh, in in the best possible way in this kind of setting and of course i'm sure you're all aware that the fed is undertaking a, a, a review exactly to discuss uh, these precise issues uh, as uh, is the ecb and uh, uh, basically, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, most efficient monetary policy tool under the current circumstances is actually asset purchases or asset sales. So we expect uh, uh, definitely QE then to be the dominant policy, monetary policy tool going forward. And, uh, and we think that uh, central banks' balance sheets will therefore remain uh, large. And uh, if, if we then um, 
uh, well, already during this crisis, we've seen uh, lots of examples of uh, fruitful collaboration between these two sides, the monetary policy side and the fiscal policy side. And uh, as all of these packages have been rolled out in, in unison and, uh, and as a result of consultation and coordination. So this is a bit of a flavor, I think, of the things to come in the sense that we would expect more uh, you know, overt and explicit collaboration between the various uh, branches of policy setting, fiscal, monetary policy, and also, of course, the debt issuance offices, uh, usually in the treasuries. And um, if, if everybody is doing their job uh, well, and there's not much corruption and, and things are going fine, then this uh, obviously is the appealing uh, outcome. But uh, in countries where we might uh, not have the same trust in these institutions, um, th I think this can pose a, a challenge. And even just versus our own expectations, we've been so uh, educated to think that um, uh, central banks are supremely independent, uh, that, uh, that this evolution might, uh, might indeed be something that it will take uh, us all, including the financial markets, um, some, some time to grapple with and come, come to terms with. But clearly, these bodies are interdependent. And ultimately, if we can have them collaborate in a constructive way, that's, uh, that, that, that would be the supreme outcome. So uh, I think we all have to celebrate uh, our interdependence uh, in this context, uh, which is uh, also a comment on self-sufficiency, if you wish, yeah, that uh, instinct that has propped up uh, these days. I think we have to remember that uh, interdependence is really, and open borders is what has brought this prosperity uh, until now. So uh, finally, how will we manage this debt? Uh, I'm Re Ringa will of course talk uh, more about this, but uh, in, again, coming back to the Second World War, there the experience was that um, uh, it took 30 years, basically, more or less 30 years of mostly negative real interest rates to manage this debt burden. And, uh, and I think this will also be the go-to solution uh, after the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, thank you very much. And oh, last point I wanted to make actually is that you know, another unique thing in this circumstance is that the fiscal multiplier, the impact of fiscal policy is much greater. Uh, these days with low interest rates. So this is where we're all expecting Ringa to enlighten us uh, as to how that's going to be put into practice. Great, thank you very much, Marie. <clears throat> so what I take from your presentation uh, is uh, it's really that uh, inflation is really what we should uh, all be looking at uh, in the years to come and see to what extent it evolves and helps us to bring, bring down uh, real interest rates and, and all that burden. Um, uh, so, and I mean, maybe that's a point we can touch upon uh, during the Q&A as well. Uh, let me turn to uh, Professor Ringa Rautler, uh, who I have a uh, pleasure to introduce now. Uh, Ringa has a PhD in economics from the University of Erfurt in Germany. And for the past six years, she has worked as a professor of fiscal governance at the Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. She has also been visiting research at various uni European and American universities. Uh, Ringa has really an extensive experience in fiscal management and public administration, especially as they relate to uh, crisis times. Uh, her first-hand experience stems from researching the impact of the global financial crisis in her home country, Estonia, and in other countries. So Ringa, may I ask you now to unmute your microphone, uh, we'll share your presentation and give you control to click the slides forward. You have the floor. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us this, uh, this evening. And Marie already used a nice segue to introduce my topics. So indeed, I'll be looking a bit more at the micro level of actually how to implement the fiscal policy responses that are strongly needed right now. So when uh, we, we see indeed uh, for some reason, my slides are not moving forward. Ah, okay. So you had some spoilers, sorry about that. Okay, um, so what we see over and over again is that in crisis, the state does become 
more important than ever and uh, populations are looking up to the state for policy action. And it's also clear by now that the current crisis, the scope of it is such that it's requiring quite unprecedented fiscal policy action. Uh, so in this very short presentation, I'll try to give an overview of, uh, of the key fiscal policy responses to the COVID-19 induced economic recession and especially the challenges involved in actually implementing the fiscal policy measures using illustrations uh, from my home country, Estonia. So uh, the three key messages of my presentations are, first, this time it's different, hopefully. Second, the devil is in the details. And third, state capacity is like a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. So let's go to the first one. Uh, this time it's different, even in Estonia that in the past has been a total poster boy of fiscal discipline. As you can see in the graph, uh, as of 2019, our debt to GDP ratio was 8.7% uh, of GDP, and that's the general government debt. So uh, one could even say, or at least I would even say, Estonia has been almost pathologically obsessed with fiscal discipline by responding with austerity even during economic crisis. So if we look back at the past three decades, Estonia has always responded to economic crisis with austerity packages. Even in uh, 2009, the economy was in the free fall. We had a rainy day fund of 10% of GDP, yet the government responded to that situation with a with series of austerity packages and almost taking sort of masochistic pride in it. And well, the pain for the economy was clear. Uh, the economy um, contracted 15% and it was partly at least exacerbated by, by the fiscal policy responses. So this time, indeed, it is different even here. So uh, if we look at the stimulus package that was adopted a couple of months ago, uh, as a percentage of GDP, it's larger than the EU average, uh, about 5%. And uh, quoting uh, Ruv Tim, the Estonian finance minister, well, I never really thought I would be quoting him, but I am doing it here. He, he said, we would be idiots not to borrow now. So the government is planning to borrow up to 5 billion euros uh, this year, if necessary. So far, they borrowed over 5 billion euros. Uh, and our total annual budget uh, is about 11 billion euros. So you, that gives you a hint about the scope of, of the borrowing going on right now. And indeed, for that purpose, the government had a first international bond emission after 18 years. So the, the finance minister was almost giddy with excitement of being able to do that finally again. And there was also a bit of um, ego boost going on here since uh, we have some sibling competition going on with the other Baltic states and we wanted to see who gets better interest rates and, and we won. So um, it's a very self-congratulatory uh, feeling here at the bond emission. The interest rates are about 0.1%. So extremely low. Um, what I do hope though, uh, is that uh, this, these rounds of uh, fiscal stimulus are not followed by by another, I'm sorry. Okay, by a, by other rounds of uh, austerity, because we but we really saw last time during um, after the banks and the economy had been saved, uh, demands emerged for austerity, and that actually led to protracted um, recession. I would say in several European countries, and. Um, and weaken the state capacity. So what, what I already see merging a little bit, even in Estonia now, is the demands that in the next rounds um, of budget changes, we should also cut public sector expenditures, including the public sector wages. And I, I really do hope those do not materialize because it would worsen the economic situation and it would indeed further weaken the, the state capacity. Uh, okay. Then, uh, let's see, my slides are a bit... 
moody here. Okay, second message. Um, the devil is in the details. So uh, it's easy to say, let's spend the money. Even the, the bond issue, issue part, that's the easy part. The difficult part is really implementing the fiscal policy measures appropriately and effectively. And um, for that, you need capable public sector organizations. So what uh, we can see looking at some of the instruments that were used by Estonia, um, some work pretty well, some less well. So let me try to get the next slide up as well. Uh, yes, so first looking at the wage support measure where the government um, well, essentially compensated about 70% of the salary of uh, those workers uh, whose companies had been significantly uh, affected by the crisis. And that worked well and it worked fast. And the government was able to use the existing unemployment insurance fund structure for that. Although in this case, well, it was more job insurance rather than unemployment insurance. And it did uh, help to prevent a very sudden surge in unemployment rates and also layoffs in companies that could have easily uh, continued working after the, the uh, lockdowns were lifted. But what we see is um, that certain sections of the population are falling through the net in the case of such a measure. Because uh, the wage support uh, works well for people or reaches people who have regular work contracts. However, there are increasing number of people who are not working in, in such standard four months of work, but are independent workers, self-employed, own account workers, platform workers, and so on. So in uh, the case of those people, that measure would not reach them. Second, uh, the credit and guarantees, uh, loan guarantees to companies, hasn't really worked that well so far either. Only a fraction of the appropriated money uh, has been used and here it seems that uh, the agency responsible for that measure didn't have enough capacity to really offer meaningful um, additions to the companies uh, that they would be interested in uh, making use of that measure and also given the fundamental uncertainty that companies are facing they might actually be hesitant to to take loans so in that situation it might be worth thinking with a sort of state equity fund might not be a better option. And finally, longer term investments. Uh, these are foreseen as well in the stimulus package. But here, of course, the, the key problem is that there aren't that many shovel ready projects. It takes about six to 12 months to get um, uh, projects up shovel ready, so to say. Okay, then um, finally, uh, the third message. Uh, what is emerging? Uh, I'm trying to get the slide again. Uh, yeah, what is emerging from these example, examples as well is that state capacity in implementing fiscal policy really is like a muscle. So if you don't use it, um, you lose it. And uh, what I would claim is that the neoliberal policies, austerity measures that have been adopted in many European countries over the past decade have actually atrophied the capacity of, uh, of the governments to actually undertake um, sophisticated fiscal, fiscal policy action. Okay, so what can we do about it all? I have a couple of suggestions, but I would actually be really interested to hear from the audience as well, uh, what do you think could, could be the possible solutions here? So first of all, uh, I think uh, we need to consciously build up uh, fiscal policy capacities in, in the government. Um, and that includes analytical, technological capacities, also collaborative capacities, and so on. Second, I think we should consciously promote the prestige of the public sector in order to get good people who want to become civil servants. Third, uh, it would be useful to develop a portfolio of shovel-ready projects so that next time we actually hit the recession, we have a, a set of projects already ready that can, can be instantly, instantaneously be uh, implemented. And finally, uh, e-government solutions. Well, Estonia is the world leader, allegedly, in uh, e-government. And I'm not really sure whether that is true, but I'm sure we are the world leader in e-government PR. 
So what, uh, but well, we, we do have pretty good e-government solutions. Um, and what I can see here is that yes, they help. Uh, having uh, electronic identification, authentication systems, signature uh, systems, and so on, they help to implement at least some of the instruments in applying for the benefits and processing the benefits, uh, benefit claims, and so on. But no matter what uh, fancy government solutions we have, they are not going to tell us what the meaningful loan conditions would be for, for the companies that the government could offer or whether equity would be better than loans. So um, I, I guess I will finish here and I'm looking forward to the discussion and also suggestions from your part about what can we do uh, in the future to, to build up such capacities in the governments. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, Ringa. Excellent, uh, into very interesting this uh, presentation and I would uh, maybe add to your last question also Maybe get some feedback from our uh, audience on not only on the management of uh, the asset side of uh, governments, but also on the liabilities on debt management and, and exactly with the same idea that to what extent we actually need experience in debt management. Uh, I think that I saw some questions already in the, in the chat box that might be, might be useful. So with that, I give it over to, I hand it over to Daniel who will guide us through the Q&A uh, and, and uh, moderate the question. Please continue uh, adding your question in the chat box and, uh, and I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion. Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Eckhart, and thank you very much uh, to our two presenters for two excellent uh, presentations. Um, as Eckhart has said, please um, put your questions in the chat box uh, first, and I would encourage you also to um, ask the questions uh, yourselves directly to the two presenters. Uh, I will nevertheless abuse my uh, role as moderator and ask uh, one uh, brief question to Ringa first, uh, before I would like to hand over to uh, Michele, who has a question on the accumulation of debt, and then after that to Nomzamo, who has a question on uh, the capacity of government and the role of corruption in that sense. Uh, so my question to Ringa, I uh, just out of curiosity, uh, where does the fiscal conservatism in Estonia uh, <laughs> come from? I mean, we have these two uh, camps in the European Union, uh, you know, some seem to be spending a lot and the others seem to be spending not enough. Uh, the populist uh, arguments are, uh, oh, the ones, one of them can deal better with money than the others, but, um, you know, maybe there are more serious um, reasons behind that. Mm -hmm. Is it a conservative government? Is it culture? Um, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, very good question. I've had to explain that to many of my fellow uh, economists uh, who are equally puzzled uh, by, by such an obsessive commitment to fiscal discipline. And, and I, I think it helps to take a historical view here. And uh, it really helps if we look at in, in the early 90s, the kind of economic policy choices that were made. So when Estonia adopted a currency board as an anchor, for uh, macroeconomic stabilization that certainly dictated very conservative fiscal policy. So that was, it was a design question. Second, in the early 90s, it was impossible for a newly independent country to go out to the financial markets and say, okay, here we are, finally, can you lend us some money? So that it was impossible to borrow. So the government had to cut the expenditures by about 25% in 1992 uh, when Estonia became independent. And so there was a set of macroeconomic policy choices, the balanced budget, proportional, proportional income tax, uh, that then gradually became to be associated in the Estonian identity almost with economic success. There were, and partly I think it, would, it had also something to do with the fact that we have been so dependent on another regime and another country, so to say, and we wanted to show we can do it independently, that we can manage it. We will suffer through it, but we, we can do it on our own. And then uh, gradually, of course, uh, the EU um, uh, fiscal rules started uh, so sort of nudging us towards um, fiscal discipline. And also um, during the last crisis, it actually had um, 
besides sort of uh, conservative fiscal ideology. But I, I think for the most part of our independence, this has actually been shared by most of the parties across the spectrum. It's only, I would say, during the last decade that has shifted somewhat. But uh, during 2009, our political elite thought that the way to exit the crisis was to join the Eurozone. So, and they thought in order to do that, we had to remain under the Maastricht criteria of 3% and we'll do whatever it takes, literally. So even if it hurt the economy to the extent that it did, we got in and that helped to sort of stabilize the situation. And as the reason why we thought it was so important to join the Eurozone was because uh, Estonia is strongly dependent on FDI for its economic development. And once you have uh, exchange rate speculations that really starts hurting the FDI. So it was uh, seen as a way to exit the crisis. So that was a uh, rather long answer <laughs> to the short question, but uh, but I think it's useful to know. And it is, I think, puzzling to, to a lot of people who are not from Estonia why we are like that so far. Well, th thanks very much, actually. I was interested in hearing uh, if the Maastricht uh, criteria played any role, and it seemed mm -hmm. uh, they did. Yes. Um, yeah, so the next question, which is related to this, uh, Michele had a question about uh, the accumulating uh, debt. Michele, do you want to pose the question yourself? Okay, thank you. Thank you all, uh, both speakers, for an excellent presentation. My question, very straightforward, is, uh, is the following. Does it make sense to continue accumulating debit over and over? This seems uh, evident uh, everywhere, every country is going to accumulate debit. Uh, uh, so, to be a little bit provocative, is the system damaged or it was designed like that? It, think, it seems that sometimes the market is uh, more powerful than uh, some country state as well. So what is your, your opinion about that? Thank you very much. Um, Ma Marie, do you want to start and then? Okay. Okay, well, I mean, you know, we, we do indeed, uh, as, uh, as Ring has just uh, explained also, you know, all of us have a, a, a somewhat uh, emotional relationship uh, with that. The Swiss uh, certainly do as well, uh, very, uh, you know, prudent and, and not willing to, to take on much debt. But um, at the same time, we sort of have to realize that, that taking on debt is actually something that allows us to realize superior economic outcomes. And, uh, and you know, I think we've all had the experience in one way or another that it, we need money yeah, to be able to borrow. So, so the most indebted countries in the world are also the richest countries in the world and and these two things are related obviously i mean if we bring it into our own home lives you know if if we certainly in switzerland if we decide not to borrow in order to buy a house and we save all our lives in order to buy this house we're probably going to be somewhere close to 80 by the time we can do that perhaps and uh, and we will have lived all our life you know uh, it, perhaps well, but not in the house that we desired. So clearly debt is a, is, is a good thing in general. It's just that we can't take on too much debt, obviously. So it depends on what we have on the liability side uh, or on the asset side rather, excuse me. Um, and, and this is also pertinent with uh, what I said earlier about Japan, because uh, although we estimate country assets badly, uh, but but we do know sort of what they own in terms of financial assets and houses and roads and and bridges and such. Yeah. So at least counting the assets that we can readily count, it uh, appears according to the IMF that Japan would have assets that cover their debt. So so that's another reason why we should perhaps fret less about Japan's debt to GDP ratio than many other countries. I, no offense to the Belgians, but it seems to me that I recall from the same study that the IMF found that, that Belgium that has a much lower debt to GDP ratio uh, actually perhaps didn't quite have enough assets to cover that, yeah. So, um, so, so this is always uh, the issue. You should, you should not borrow any more than you can afford to repay and to service. And, and of course, we have uh, plenty of examples where, um, where, where that uh, sensible thought has not been respected. Um, Argentina, for instance, is obviously currently 
renegotiating its uh, sovereign debt. So, um, so debt, debt is good, but not too much and make sure that you have enough assets to cover it. There you go. Uh, <laughs> okay, Ringa, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I would like to add in a European context that it is, as uh, Marie pointed out, I think several countries are at the threshold where uh, they, have, they are facing serious debt overhang issues and, and uh, questions of uh, ability to, to pay it back. And that is now, I think, exactly the time where the EU has to develop its fiscal capacity. And uh, the borrowing, I think, in the next uh, period should much more massively take place by the EU. Because, uh, I mean, that would really allow us to correct a core flaw in the architecture of the, the Eurozone, where you have currency union without a fiscal union. If the EU develops more of its fis own fiscal co capacity by borrowing itself, rather than only uh, letting the, the member states to borrow, uh, it's also better to coordinate the fiscal and monetary policy. And Marie also pointed out that that's extremely important uh, going forward. And also, um, we have to remember the doom loop between the sovereign debt risk and the bank risk. So uh, in order to avoid uh, the spiral going down, it's really important that we, we actually protect um, the sovereign debts going into um, uh, sort of bus cycle as, as it did uh, about a decade ago. So I think here, uh, having a coordinated, bold, decisive fiscal action by the EU, which also entails borrowing but by the EU, and uh, then also having a plan to actually increase their own source revenues for the EU, I think is the best solution for it. So it shouldn't be only the member states borrowing, but it should be the EU borrowing. And it's, it's currently on the table, negotiated. Let's see how it works out. But I think we don't really have any other choice at this point. If that's not going to happen, I think it could very well be lethal to the Eurozone and maybe even to the EU. Yes, thanks. Uh, I'm also all for uh, a bigger role of the EU in fiscal uh, policy and borrowing, but that means also that they would be able to tax. Yes. And then we may have to think also about changing the political system because then no taxation without representation. So I am, I'm all for it, but it may be a little bit more complicated. Sure. Um, I, I would move uh, to Nonsamo, who had a question which was related to the capacity uh, of governments to actually um, execute um, a fiscal policy. And then after that, I would like to bring Mary in, who had a question on trade and foreign investment. Uh, Nomzamo, do you want to uh, please pose your question yourself? Yes. Uh, we just can you hear heard. Me, Daniel? Yes. Yes. Now we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my concern is based on the corruption within the government sector, particularly in the states uh, which because currently during the pandemic uh, we have seen a number of promises from the government um, uh, this includes the, one of the the state of the nation address made by our president for an example uh, in terms of um, rescuing the poor and um, most of those deliverables or promises uh, were never achieved so I'd like to know in terms of uh, the solutions because you find that countries borrow but uh, the question is where does that money goes to so yeah yeah thanks i think that question is to ringa yes uh, i mean uh, <laughs> because pa scholars economists and so on and political scientists have struggled with the question of how we alleviate uh, the co corruption for decades so um I mean, I, I wish I, I had a magical solution for it, how, how to make sure that it actually reaches the people. I mean, at this point, uh, it is the question whether the people themselves are then able to use any kind of account me accountability mechanisms that are out there to call out the, the corrupt practices. And I, I think these days, having the social media so pervasive, that could be maybe utilized as a, as a vehicle also for, uh, for showing where, where the corrupt practices could be 
um, implemented. But yeah, I, I think it's um, it is a very tragic another doom loop that we have between inequality and the virus because it, it really the virus hitting countries that have high inequality more and the inequality and the virus in itself is making inequality worse. So I am actually extremely worried about how the developing countries are um, are going to handle the, the economic um, doom on the horizon. And um, and yeah, here if we had better uh, prepared, less corrupt governments in place, it would be a lot easier. But I, I totally see your concern uh, of spending the money um, for the, so to say, good, but uh, disappearing in the process. Does maybe, Marie, do you have any <laughs> good suggestions uh, how to solve the corruption in the developing world? No, not necessarily at all, I'm afraid. But it, just to, the, to add the comment that, you know, it, Europe, I think this uh, is a, a statistic from, uh, from, uh, from the European Commission, if I'm not mistaken, that, uh, that corruption, even in Europe, costs Europe 6% of Europe's GDP. And, and this is Europe, you know? So then we can imagine what it costs in, uh, in, in a, a large number of other places. And uh, so, so it's, it's clearly a huge tax yeah, on everything we do uh, that we sort of first have to pay before we can do anything sensible. And, uh, and, and obviously that should be a huge incentive to, yeah. to be correct. Yeah, but I guess in the, in the long term, uh, the idea of having a capable public sector is really hard to get the good people there who then sort of uh, reinforce the equilibrium of non-corruption. And I, I think sort of constantly beating and denigrating and bashing the public sector is also counterproductive in the sense that then it would keep away the good, smart people who could then actually make it better. So one, one needs to also find a balance here. True, true. And it, it, we, we can look at Brazil, for instance, which I must say that, you know, up until uh, sort of recently, uh, I, I greatly admired for their tenacity in really going after uh, all the corruption that they could uh, investigate and, and identify and pinpoint and prosecute. So, and they've been doing that for an, a, a large number of years now. So, so the, that's what it takes. It takes a, a committed individuals to really pursue this long-term, it's long-term solutions, I think. Slow to put into practice overnight. You cannot do it overnight, yeah. Okay, um, there was a question on uh, foreign trade and on foreign investment um, by Mary. And after that, I would like to get back once more on the um, on the debt question, there was a question by Steve and um, another question. So, but first, uh, Mary, do you want to pose your question on um, foreign investment and foreign trade? Okay, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Oh. Okay, my question was that during the pandemic, trade is effectively disrupted and investments by foreign investors are clouded with uncertainties. Countries gear up with long economic repercussions. So how do we protect the individual investor cons considering that most countries do not reimburse invest investors once things like the, once we face uncertainties like the pandemic, you see, yeah. Absolutely. I think these are, obviously trade is a huge issue in, in general, also with the protectionism that has come back, uh, you know, since 2016, pretty much with uh, the uh, referendum in the UK, obviously, and, and the policy of the Trump administration in the US. And, uh, and it's, there's not a perfectly linear relationship between trade and GDP, but uh, nevertheless, they, they do tend to move together. So uh, less trade, less growth, uh, less uh, capacity to borrow or finance this debt. So, um, so and, and then exactly as you say, on top of uh, already that quite negative trend uh, comes uh, this pandemic and, and makes it even worse. So, you know, the uncertainty we have on these issues is just uh, enormous. 
uh, according to the WTO, they, their estimate for trade uh, contraction this year is between 10 and 30 <laughs> percent. Yeah, so it's not even, it's not funny. I apologize for laughing, but it's just unprecedented uncertainty is what I'm trying to say. So, um, and, and how to, um, you know, I, I, I really welcome this question because I, I was sort of trying to subliminally allude to all of these issues with the, the idea that we need to celebrate interdependence. You know, and now there's a lot of people saying, oh, we have to be more self-sufficient because we've seen how the production chains don't work and uh, we can't uh, find the, the equipment that we need, essential products and so on. But, uh, but, you know, in reality, the only way we can do that is, is by keeping the borders open. Uh, so uh, so it, it affects not only goods, but also people. Yeah, we need to have people moving around when, you know, when the, when the virus allows us to do this. Uh, and I mean, what can I take as an example? Food, for instance, you know, food production, 80% of the world's people eat food produced in other countries. I mean, nothing can be as essential to us as a product as food, right? So if we now realize that everybody imports food from everywhere else and we try to say, oh, we're going to become self-sufficient, we realize that this is simply not possible. And uh, uh, also we, we need uh, in, in Europe and in the US uh, probably about a million migrant workers to bring in the harvest this year. Yeah. So there too, we see that without open borders, we, we will render our systems not more sustainable and robust, but actually more fragile and, uh, and obviously inadequate to meet uh, the essential needs uh, of, of the population. Now, you know, your question, how do we solve this during the COVID crisis, uh, you know, with great difficulty, obviously, but, uh, but perhaps by having uh, important people, politicians and so on, uh, preaching this message, because of course, if they preach the opposite message, then whatever happens after this pandemic uh, will probably be not as good. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I'm very pro-European also, let me just add that, yeah, and, and, and a staunch defender of these four freedoms, yeah, the four pillars of the EU, uh, freedom of movement of goods, uh, services, capital, and people. This, I think, is the foundation, not only of our whole civilization, which is actually also the case, but certainly, uh, what has brought the pros prosperity. And these things are under attack now, uh, partly because of the pandemic, and we really need to find a way, uh, all of us together, to defend those ideas. Thank you. Um, Steve had a question, which I think brings us back to the um, amount of debt and how we measure what is the uh, you know, how much debt is enough. Uh, Steve, do you want to pose your question yourself? Yes, I was wondering whether the conventional target for fiscal policy, including in the Maastricht criteria of debt to GDP, has caused us to perhaps obsess too much about debt. And I think you've touched on this already a little bit. And I wonder if you could say a bit more about uh, what a better alternative target for fiscal policy might be that would take account of the good investments in um, public assets that might increase our ability to withstand future shocks and, and to pay for the commitments we've already made. And I'll direct, direct my question first to Ringa. Hi, Ringa. Yes, it's great to meet you and a great, great question. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, after the EU has sort of uh, put out the fire, uh, uh, then I think the next uh, work that's on the table is revising the fiscal governance framework. Uh, because by now, clearly, we can see it doesn't work. One, it is way too complicated. By there is, it, there is such a Byzantine maze of complex fiscal rules that there is, a, I think, a joke in Brussels that only two people in the Commission understand these rules in their entirety. And uh, most, many, many countries are over the, the, the 60% of GDP um, uh, anyway, and indeed, one can question whether that's a meaningful line. It's exactly because we need debt for investing uh, for future productivity and, and so on. So I think what would make more sense is to have some set of expenditure rules that uh, also would help to um, act 
counter-cyclically. So uh, I, I think uh, obsessing about the debt and deficit has been a bit too problematic in the EU, and uh, so the, the fiscal compact will have to be rewritten, no doubt. Okay. Okay, uh, we are approaching the end. Uh, if you keep uh, your questions brief, I would uh, let uh, uh, you ask two more questions. One by uh, Sanja on how to finance or should we finance long term and short term? And the other question was, I think, posed by Mark on uh, what kind of stimul stimulation packages we should, um, we should prefer. Uh, Sanja, you want to ask your question on the, on the financing? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to know from Marie as well as Ringa, uh, their take on whether in these times of low interest rates, uh, governments should rather borrow um, in the short term, something like 10 or 15 or 20 years, or should they incur debt uh, of about um, 100 years? What is your take on that? So uh, I'll go for that one. Yeah. <laughs> so I love the way you say short term, 10, 20, 50 years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, there's always an interest, uh, I think, for, um, uh, for, for a government uh, to try to have a, a reasonably long average maturity of its debt. Uh, I actually don't know now what the average might be. I, I would think perhaps uh, many mature economies have seven years or so probably might be a ballpark figure for the average uh, debt maturity. And the advantage of having it, you know, whatever it is a bit longer is that if you enter a crisis and not all your debt is short term, then you have a greater chance of coming out of that crisis in a, in a better shape. You might find it really difficult to roll over 50% of your debt within one or two years or whatever it might be. Uh, but then on the other hand, you know, a hundred years, yeah? You know, who, who has any visibility of what we're, you know, other than the climate experts, yeah? Uh, uh, about what the world is going to look like in a hundred years time. So, so uh, but you know, hey, these days, this is what the investors are going for. So I think certainly governments should take the opportunity uh, if they can and if they can do this at attractive levels, which seems to be the case uh, at the moment for uh, some countries, Austria, right? And um, yeah, <laughs> so, you, you know, it's only marginally above the 10-year rate. You know, this is, uh, this is money for nothing. Nobody should refuse money for nothing. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's uh, I think, uh, the bottom line there. Now, for the investor, of course, the longer the maturity of the bond you might buy, the riskier you, or more sensitive you make your portfolio to the swings in interest rates. Yeah, So it's uh, more dangerous for investors to, to buy such long-dated instruments, but good for the debt management office. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you have the honor to ask the last question on what should we actually use those fis fiscal um, packages for? Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, in the last financial crisis, we ended up um, subsidizing uh, fossil fuels and, and uh, unsustainable uh, businesses. Um, in this financial, in this crisis, um, I've seen France has been quite strict with Air France um, insisting on them reducing their, their domestic uh, activity. Um, Germany have not put, done the same with Lufthansa. Um, is there a, uh, you know, is there, is there a possibility to make it more um, linked to, um, to industrial policy and, and moving to a greener and more sustainable e economy? Absolutely. I, I think this, this is an important opportunity. So if there is any silver lining to anything in this crisis, I think it is exactly the point that you made, that we have now the possibility to use the fiscal capacity for green growth and for uh, sustainable climate um, action and so on. So I, I think this is exactly the point. This should be where the longer term investments should go to. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I found this was a really, really interesting um, Q&A session, uh, very rich uh, questions. And uh, I would thank you uh, both presenters for uh, answering these questions and also, of course, our audience for posing such good questions. Eckhart, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you to both speakers. Excellent uh, Q&A. Uh, um, also, as you said, from our, our community, from our audience, thanks to all for being so active again uh, tonight. Um, and uh, obviously, we hope that uh, we, uh, you all enjoyed it as much as, as we did. Uh, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we published a recorded webinar later this week on YouTube, as we have a chance to basically continue uh, your discussion there. If you want to, you can also ask questions. Uh, we will try to follow up as much as, uh, as we can and, uh, and obviously in encourage you to uh, engage uh, in the discussion. There, uh, the, as you see on the slide, there are other links that you can engage with us. We have a LinkedIn group, which we are, where, which we are very active at. Uh, we have a Facebook uh, site and a Twitter handle. Uh, obviously, you can also get in touch with us directly through our email uh, and website where you can find latest information on our upcoming events. Talking about which, next week we will have another webinar next Wednesday where we talk about uh, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on international trade. We, will, we are extremely pleased to have Emmanuel Gunn from the WTO and Jan Hoffmann from UNCTAD uh, to, to open the discussion for us and we hope that all of you will be able to join us again next, uh, next week to discuss with them. And then the last, be, last webinar before the summer break uh, will be on the 15th of ju July and what we want to do there is a bit of a different uh, uh, activity, we call it a virus meets arts where we have a live performance and a presentation about Art Hub from one of our Geneva Macro Labs uh, uh, community members. So please join us for these last two uh, webinars before the summer break and then after the break we will continue uh, in September uh, with our regular events. So thank you very much for joining us tonight and I wish you all a pleasant evening. Um, uh, stay in touch with us uh, and, uh, and hope to, to get to know to see more of you uh, in, the, in, the coming, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, have a pleasant evening, have a pleasant rest of the day, stay healthy and talk again next Wednesday. Thank you very much. Goodbye for now. Thank you.